There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to another trip to the Innerverse. I'm your host, Chance, and I'm once again honored to have you tuning in and grateful we can digitally convene for another helping of healthy self-exploration and heady synthesis of excellent ideas. One of the biggest memes in many modern spiritual circles is the emphasis on self-love and self-respect. And although we've all likely been working on this in our own ways with positive thinking and mindfulness, a common problem with many spiritual paths is a lack of knowledge about our bodies. And in some cases, an outright repression or revulsion towards our physical vehicle and the so-called fallen world that we inhabit. The truth is, there's an undeniable equation to the self that reduces down to body equals mind equals spirit. You could also throw in an equals energy there too, and you'd be correct. So in our quest for personal evolution and healing, it really helps to work on all three of our operating systems at once. And if we ignore our physical practices, Not only will our health suffer, but our magic, manifestation, relationships, and everything else in our orbit will reflect the diminished energy as our personal life force slowly wanes. But never fear, because even if we've let ourselves go for all too long without feeling truly vital, enlivened, and at home within our corporeal shell, the road to wholeness is never far away. And with knowledge, we can always find it again. Thankfully, we've got one heavenly storehouse of earthly learning joining us today, and I've been getting jazzed up to talk to him for weeks after discovering his powerhouse of a podcast. The show I'm talking about is called This Esoteric Life, and the host of this awesome archive of practical occultism is the wizard of Taoist wisdom and smooth-talking Qigong sensei known in this incarnation as Christopher Seafree Freeman. The illustrious Sea Free can be frequently found discussing Dantians, teaching folks how to breathe, and transforming fragile egos into strong personas on his excellent podcast. And you can find everything he's been up to over the years at thisesotericlife.com. He's also started an excellent video series on breathing techniques and provided a budding bundle of positive occult teachings over on his Patreon channel, which he calls The Light Club. Check the show notes for this episode to find links to Sea Free's show his light club on Patreon, and his excellent Instagram page at this underscore esoteric underscore life underscore podcast, where he's also a master of magnificently uplifting meme magic. I'd also like to remind you that if you dig Interverse and you want to double your informational entertainment, you can become a plus member at patreon.com forward slash Interverse. You can find the link to it from the Interversepodcast.com website or the show notes for any and all episodes. A meager five bucks a month gets you unlimited access to the growing archive of extended shows, and I have no doubts about the fact that the second hour always goes deeper and further into the mystical material that you came here for in the first place. But now it's time to get this empowerment party started, but not without one more reminder that the more you focus on your breathing, the easier and more enjoyable everything will be. So take a few conscious gulps of oxygen and perhaps see if you can keep a good rhythm going throughout this episode. I'm sure we'll talk about breathing enough that you'll be reminded of it if you forget. (laughs) So here we go, everybody. Please clap your astral hands and give a psychic plane high five. Welcome to the self-illuminated leader of the Light Club and our resident expert on esoteric Taoism, the one and only C. Free, here for his first visit to the podcast. Thanks for being here, dude, and welcome to Interverse. Thank you, brother. That was really nice, man. That was really nice. I really appreciate that. So sweet. I I feel my middle Dantian feels really good right now. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good, man. I'd love you to introduce yourself a little bit before we get cracking too. I mean, I get flowery with my words as I get into your creation as the guest du jour, but I'm sure that there's a lot about you that we don't know and we'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So who am I? That's an interesting question. I'll just tell you who I am right now. That's perfect. Right now, I am a Qigong teacher, and I am training to be a hypnotherapist. And I'm working with people, clients, you know, on these things. 
And I'm very interested in what you might call proto-science, which is the idea that there are things that come to us from ancient times that's, that really work and are very functional. So a couple of these, these sort of mysteries would be the life force, the chi, and another one would be the subconscious mind. So I'm very interested in these things. Uh, do the podcast, This Esoteric Life. My background is in the Western esoteric tradition, and then I found my way into a Eastern approach, you could say, right? And I'm very interested in how it's a lot easier than we think, if I could say it like that. Like, it's a lot simpler than we realize. It's much more near than we might think. And like what you said about the, you know, new age uh, questionable ideas that are out there. Something that might happen a lot to us is that we get in our heads, we read a book or we see Thich Nhat Hanh or we see, we hear stories about the esoteric Jesus or all the yogis and the Taoist immortals. And we basically think that we have to be that. Right. And so in ancient times, the reason you'd write this stuff down and the reason you'd tell stories about the Buddha is so that we can all know what the end looks like, not the beginning. And so that's what I'm interested in is things like Qigong and things like hypnosis, especially learning self hypnosis with the guidance of being hypnotized uh, by hypnotherapists. These represent to me. Not the quickest way, because it's not about it being easy, but ways that are very, very dependable and very effective for us to access these spiritual dimensions of ourselves. And because Qigong comes from a medical tradition, Chinese medicine, and because hypnosis has this hypnotherapy practice, what these are is like spiritual arts that have a real good grounding in the mental well-being or the physical well-being and the mental well-being and they both do both right so they both do both so that's that's my interest that's what i'm interested in and maybe that says something about me that that's the introduction i would give for myself but i teach qigong and i do hypnosis and it's it's a very beautiful thing and i do my podcast and i love that podcast i've been really into it and there's a great archive for i mean i'm disappointed that i never heard of it before more recently because it's like right up my alley, but it is always nice whenever you find a new show that's awesome and you can pick cherry pick through topics and eventually work your way through a big archive. And yeah, people should definitely check out this esoteric life. If you like Interverse, you will definitely like this esoteric life. I'm positive about that. And I love that your description of who you are is really grounded in the present moment. You know, that means you've probably, <laughs> you're probably over and done with a lot of stuff from the past and it's not as relevant anymore or whatever. And I think that's cool. I mean, not that people's personal journey isn't interesting, but you have a really strong focus on what you want and what you're here to create and what you're here to share. And that's pretty awesome. And I want to talk about Qigong a lot, especially. Uh, but before I talk about that, can you catch maybe some newbies up on what exactly Qi is? Because I always like to say, if there's no such thing as Qi, then why can some martial artists break stuff with their head when another person would have broken their head on the stuff? <laughs> the answer is, of course, chi. I mean, you did figure that out already, right? <laughs> you definitely figured that one out. <laughs> well, yeah, the answer is chi. I'd love to do that. You know what? Let me say something else. Because you know what? You just, I didn't even know what I was doing, I guess. But you're right. I didn't mention the past. I used to have America-itis really bad. So like big overweight guy from an overweight family, real, real loco in my brain, man. Really, <laughs> I used to really be going through it all. And these things that I found, these things helped me really get free. So that's, that's like the story. But you know what? You're right, dude. I'm almost not focused enough on that. And thank you for indulging this moment of clarity you gave me <laughs> when you taught me something about myself just now is that, wow, I really am like super not <laughs> like super not in the past. That's a tough identity to shed the America American itis, as you said, because it's always like right there on the fringes around your life, ready for you to like 
go buy a 64 ounce big gulp or whatever. <laughs> you know, we've all probably experienced the the challenges of what is normalized in our culture. So it's cool to be able to transcend. And I took a very gentle path to mental and physical well-being. I took a very gentle path. I really empowered myself along the way. And so I didn't miss any of the milestones. Like I got to have all the experiences that they talk about in a lot of the books. I got a long way to go, but I've had a lot of the experiences and been able to repeat them and duplicate them. Like working with your energy successfully. You know how much self-confidence that would give you to go, I worked with my chi and I did a good job. You know, and just imagine this, the, the other things you do, imagine you could do at that point. You go, dude, I can work with my chi, bro. Right. And now you're so confident in your ability to do things to work with life. Right. So what is the chi? Well, there's two ways we can look at it when we ever we have. Whenever we have an esoteric concept, there's basically these two ways we can come at it. And one of them is better, (laughs) in my opinion. There's two ways we can look at any esoteric or spiritual concept, and one is better. (laughs) There's an abstract way we can look at it, and then there is a literal or precise way we can look at it. Okay, so what is chi? Chi is the life force. It's your life. So if you want a nice abstraction that's not too abstract, your life force, forget about what is chi just for a second. We'll get back to that. But what is your chi? Your chi is your life. It's your life. What that means to you, you know, it's deep. Another thing that chi is, let's be very literal. (laughs) Literally. It, look at your hands, the bottom of your palms, if you're not driving. Is there blood in your hands, right? Is there blood in your hands? How's your circulation, right? How's the blood circulating in your body? If your hands are kind of cold, if it's like kind of cold outside, are you able to maintain blood flow? If it's not too cold, if like in the house, it's a little chilly here in New Orleans. But your blood flow, the quality of your blood flow, that's the cheat. Because it's not just about, is there blood? There's more to it than blood. There's a relationship the blood has with the tissues in your body, with the fascial network, with the muscles, with the nerves. The fascia pretty much are the physical component of the acupuncture channels and the meridians. So what is the condition in this hand right here that I'm holding up? What is the condition, the relationship between the blood, the oxygen, the fascial tissue, the muscle, the bone? What is the relationship between all of these things? And of course, you know, Qi has like 50 definitions at least in the Chinese dictionary. So keep in mind that as I even say this, this is only one little thing. But if you just meditate on this, what is the physical, touch your hand, look at it. What is the physical relationship between all of these different components that make up my hand and my handness? So, for example, doing Qigong can, do, can really help you with uh, diseases or problems of age. You know, keep in mind, I'm not a medical doctor and you're always advised to seek uh, medical advice before changing anything in your health plan, but uh, you can look this up and see that things like Qigong, Tai Chi are very, very good for preventing arthritis and helping people who have it to relieve their symptoms. And the reason this would be is because one of the focuses of a Qigong practice is to get your blood to circulate better, but to not drain the energy that creates. So when you exercise, right, you start getting pumped up, pumped up, pumped up, you get all this energy, and then boom, you go spend it on your exercise, okay? But if you're doing Qigong, you're doing part of that. You're moving the body. You're increasing blood flow. You're increasing oxygen. You're building energy, okay? And you're establishing this in a relaxed way. So that's putting you in touch with something outside yourself. And you're building up this movement of of energy in the body, literally, 
Okay. But then you're keeping it. You see it? You're keeping it. So what are we keeping? Hmm. What is that? And when I say we're keeping it, is that just a metaphor? Is that just a way to look at it? Well, no, it feels that way. So when we talk about chi, the first question we often have, because we come from a scientific culture, is we think, what is it in the third person? Hmm. What is it in the third person? How can I put it in a laboratory and look at it? But that's not how this was developed. It was developed from the inside out. The laboratory that developed this system was an inner laboratory, but it was shared by many over thousands of years. It was shared by many. But it was an inner laboratory. So the first question when we, when we say uh, any esoteric concept can be abstract or can be very specific. It can be very literal. So what we want to do is we want to literalize that concept until it becomes something in us, until it becomes totally experiential. And what that is, is when we talk about chi, it's something in the body. It's like if you take a nice deep breath, dude, and you slow exhale, super duper 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 slow, and you do that for a few minutes, your, your blood circulation will probably increase. You'll notice your hands get warmer, right? So that's a one that's common actually in multiple traditions. So that's a common knowledge about the power of the exhale to increase things like energy circulation. So the idea is like, what is chi? Well, that is a question that each person really truly has to answer through first person experimentation. But it's okay to take everything I just said when I was talking about blood flow oxygen, bioelectricity, how the fascia, the joints, the bones, the piezoelectricity in the fascia, all this stuff, how, what is that relationship that it has to each other and as a whole? What is that relationship? In some ways, that's literally what the chi is. But it's also at other times, it's, it's like an electricity. It's also this. So it's so complex. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to go ahead and Stop this. <laughs> Stop talking now. But I think I think I think that's a good place to start is the sense of it in your body. Well, man, that's one of the things I love about you is that you can take one subject and expand it out into so much intricacy. And yeah, I was happy to let you keep going. I was fascinated. I love that answer that it's a lot to do with the relationship between all these different parts. And one of the parts in that relationship is actually your mind, for sure. And so improving the relationship in the physical definitely can improve the way energy flows in your mind. And one thing I like to say, too, is if you move in unconventional ways, you'll think in unconventional ways. If you move in ways that you don't normally move, you will unlock this, a similar capacity mentally. So in my experience, that's one of the things Qigong has helped me with for sure. But way back... <laughs> Several minutes ago, you were talking about taking this gentle path to wholeness. And I really liked that. I wanted to comment on that about how nature really does work gradually when it's crafting something for the most part. And the only times when something huge shifts really quickly is usually like a catastrophe. In esoteric terms, you can accidentally spiritually bypass the most enjoyable milestones if you're looking at all that as work. And it's not like you're not going to have to spiral back to the basics anyway. You said in your Dantian breathing course that you have on the Light Club, which I totally experienced the same thing, that the breath is the alpha and the omega. And so maybe this would be a good time to kind of talk about what a Qigong practice looks like or feels like in the activity itself and how the breath is such a huge modulator and component of it. Okay, wonderful. So again, I'm going to keep it very literal to try to make it super plain. And you know, what's funny about when you make things literal, they get very complex, don't they? You would think it was the opposite, right? You would think when we're abstracting that things are complex or they're deep, but actually no. Abstraction is how we sum up, right? So literally, what do you, how do you get a Qigong practice? Well, one thing to do is there are classical sets, like the eight brocades is a good example of one. There are classical sets. 
you can seek out a classical set and learn about it. And you can learn it from a teacher. Now, it's an interesting thing because there's a lot of video content now. So one thing you could do is get some video stuff and do it on your own. And then when you've got a little bit of practice down, you can go and pay some money and hang out with the teacher online or in person and say, hey, check out what I'm doing. Give me some uh, feedback on it. So you get a practice by doing two things. You start learning about forms and you just start doing it. And you, like you said, you, you move in an unconventional way and it kind of makes you like, you know, like start considering things in a different way, but it's the unconventional way you're moving is very peaceful and stabilizing. And so it's just this way it has you looking at things. Then you go and you talk with somebody who already has that perspective and who's a little further along that path than you. And that gives you the insight you need to really have your own practice. So it's not that you need a teacher or you don't need a teacher. It's that at some point, you're going to want to make sure that what you've got is the real thing. Okay. So there is a way that these things can go where we basically imagine ourselves doing things that we're not really doing. I know that sounds harsh, but it does happen. And so like, for example, one of the rules would be you really got to learn to do Qigong without visualizing and learning to feel it happening in the body as a safety measure for making sure things are really happening. One thing that I've heard from, and I think in my experience though, with this, that it is kind of possible to use the imaginary capacity you have to give your body and mind a language to communicate the feeling of the energy flow to. Cause if you've like never perceived that and it's like the sense atrophies and mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. it is kind of an internal and a, some, to some degree mentally interpreted feeling. I mean, I like I, what you're saying definitely makes sense that you could also go too far. And let me tell you what, what is great about what you just said. Okay. So that's an inference. So the visualization, if it leads to something really happening, what you have done is you've done an inference. So the visualization is like a VR that you're putting over the thing that's happening in the body so you can see it and notice it. So if you've done that, you're good, right? You're totally good. But simply, we need to know that in energy work, there's a danger of visualization, which means we can just be visualizing, just imagining. Okay. And so but what you're saying, I would call that an inference or an interface technique in a way. And so some, some people out there, especially really visual types, are going to do great at that. So it's not that we can't visualize. You know what I mean? It's absolutely. All these tools are very important and everything is very important. It's more like when we're talking about specific things, we need to know that that's simply the way it, the spectrum works. So if you've got a really good visualization VR interface that's doing something, that's fantastic. You know what I mean? I love that you call it a VR. Would you say that someone has found a good practice or, or set of movements if in doing them repeatedly they actually start to teach the person how to do it more correctly almost intuitively as you go because that's my been my experience like i learned these movements from a video series and i probably only watched through it twice it was like an eight-week course it was awesome but then after that the more i did it the more I would almost like self-correct and without necessarily having to remember back, it was just that like the energy flow that I was feeling would suggest the right way that it should be done. Does that make sense? Absolutely right, bro. And that's why your visualizations are working because you're doing something very correct. There. Okay. So the forms contain multitudes. They teach you something like just doing the forms. That's why we have classical sets. It's not that there aren't other sets. There are. There are probably hundreds, right? If all told in the world, if you could discover them all, which we never will, but there are probably hundreds of really good ones. And all of them are built in a way that they start to tune you into something. You know, there's something we start to tune into. And I think it's a simple way to say it is the aura of the earth, the earth consciousness, the earth chi field. There is a field of healing. There is such a thing. And tuning into it is as much mental as physical. And yeah, I mean, 
what you're saying there is very, very beautiful, my friend. The more you do it, the more you go, oh, this is right. This is wrong. I need to do it more like this. And as you get better at the form, it changes a little and it changes internally. And you start doing different stuff on the inside and different stuff. But it's always built on top of that original understanding you had. So that's, that's what some people would say the definition of Kung Fu is, is that process of doing it every day. And it's like the process reveals something. Right, like the process is its own teaching and has its own wisdom within it. I totally concur with that. It's amazing because you would think, okay, this is I fully understood this, and then it might be two weeks later, it might be the next day, it might be months later, but all of a sudden something further clicks in there. But even whenever you're not getting a whole bunch of deep insights into like the nature of the next evolution of that particular movement. The movement itself doesn't lose any value in repetition at all. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a true treasure. Uh, one thing also I personally found enjoyable with Qigong is to do it outside barefoot when possible. And uh, like the ultimate would be next to some sort of flowing water that doesn't have much obstruction as like symbolic of what you're attempting to cultivate internally. Mm hmm. Excellent. Yeah, you could also go to any sacred site that was like a classical sacred, like Stonehenge and do Qigong around Stonehenge. You know what I mean? You could do. Yeah. So that's that's a very, very beautiful thing. I'm going to Stonehenge later this year. I'm going to do Qigong at Stonehenge <laughs> for sure. It's like what you said. It's tapping into yeah. that field of healing that is the Earth's aura. Mm -hmm. Wait, say that again. I'm sorry. Well, the sacred sites and just being grounded barefoot, all of that is like connecting you to that earth aura of healing, I would say. Things like ley lines. I'd like to go to a certain ley line intersection and do some Qigong, see what happens. You know, I'm just just an idea. <laughs> I think it would be fruitful. Yeah. There's no wrong place to do it. I'm often that strange person doing it at music festivals or something in the middle of a crowd <laughs> where other people are like drinking beers and uh, trying to get loaded to feel like energetic and happy. No, you know, not that I'm knocking on people who want to do what they want to do. Sure. That's cool. But like I can make myself feel any type of way since I gained this practice without needing a lot of the external stimulus. And I think that there's so much value in it. We could just talk about these esoteric benefits forever. Yeah, that's so true. It's so true. And uh, so I'll tell you something interesting about that. For a long time, grounding yourself to the earth and being outside and focusing on flowingness and, you know, is really, really great. There may come a time when you feel called to sort of keep it more like meaning there may be a time where you get very attracted to the idea of a practice room and like all you want to do is be in this temple and like do something within it right but it only it's only like if you feel like you have enough of the other thing right and then so there is a time where barefoot on the grass i mean dude i'm a, I'm a big believer in grounding so it's that's super good for you, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'm a huge fan of grounding. Although there may come a day in your Qigong practice, and this is true for anybody, when you want to wear shoes because there's something you've built up that you're trying to keep in a way. And you're trying to like, like that's a, that's a thing to consider. And I, I swear to God, I'm working on not being so contrarian, right? Because that's not my interest. It's always that it's yin yang, right? It's always because it's that, because there, there comes a point. And so that's what's most interesting to me is the fact that there's definitely a long time where you just want to lay on a grounded sheet every time you sleep, dude, and just get that good grounding get that good de-inflaming you know get that going dude like there's a part where you just want to just get in it dude just go swim in mother nature dude like there's a time and then there's like another thing which can happen maybe maybe not for everybody it's it's you know but it seems kind of universal where you go hmm, i really want to wear shoes now 
I want to wear black. I want to like, I want to like keep everything in, in a way, because there's something going on that I'm working on and it's really fun and it feels really good. And so it's, it's as if yang, it's as if yin and yang were real, where you have this expansive flowing it's very connected to the ground and the earth. And then sometime you might want to go the opposite and go in and go super dense in a way. Really, that's one of the hallmarks of the practice in itself is that it does express yin and yang in a balanced way. Like you're breathing in and making one motion and then you're breathing out and typically reversing that motion in some way in a, in a lot of the movements. So that totally makes sense. And if you've come to a level of internal purification where you are really able to stay grounded just through the breath and you don't need that sort of mama hug to, to make it all feel better, <laughs> that can totally, you know, because you're creating a container in yourself, you know? Yeah, no, it's not because you don't need it. It's because it's the relationship is so deep that it's like mama wants you to go go do this now, sweetheart. She wants you to go do something else, you know, but she's there. Like it's the same. It's just like, imagine feeling the full, that full connection, but even inside. Yeah. And even no matter what, you're never fully disconnected from this bioelectric field. And <laughs> bioelectric is a word you used earlier. And I love that word. And I think it definitely applies to Qigong because when I'm when I'm doing it, I often feel the, or always actually, it's not often, there's these pops and clicks, like little internal shocks where you touch something. And it seems like energy blockages just getting cracked and moved out of the way. And that is a big part of what's going on, right? You're, you're clearing these meridian channels. Can you talk about that? So there's a really great concept. It's called song, S-O-N-G. You can look it up. Song. Taoism, Qigong, just search for that. You'll find it on Google. And what this basically means is relaxing. It also means letting go. It also means releasing. But remember, these things are not abstractions. They're physical. They're literal. So I'll give you an example. If you just bring your hands up, like there's a common Qigong form where you just bring your hands up and inhale and then you bring them down as you exhale. So if you were to essentially create a wave of relaxation that went down from the top, you know, if anybody's driving, don't let me hypnotize you right now. <laughs> Blink your eyes, stay awake, don't let me hypnotize you by saying this. If you were to create a wave of relaxation that started above your head and really relaxed your whole face and your whole skull and your neck and then your shoulders, and this wave of relaxation could all fall through your torso, your arms to your fingers, all the way down to your toes. If you could do that just by taking one breath, right? if you could inhale and then exhale and allow a wave of relaxation to follow, to travel down your whole body, releasing and relaxing everything down. In a sense, it feels like you're hanging your muscles from your bones. It feels like your bones almost rise up as your muscles sink and hang from them. And this creates this very solid feeling. So just to give you an example, like the idea would be that there's a state we can be in where it's that easy to relax and release. And we want to, that's not easy, but it can be that easy. You see, right? That's yeah, hard as heck to do. Dude. That's a, that's Kung Fu. It will take years. But if you get 10% of the way, it's going to feel so good. That'll be worth it times a hundred, right? You would have spent a hundred years trying to get that feeling like that, right? So the idea is that as every inhale is meant to bring our awareness back to our body and every exhale should relax the entire body. So we have built into us at our like peak breathing level, this innate capacity of inhale, my awareness, just like the air enters my body, my awareness enters my body and then exhale. And you can see it when, if you do class with me or something, right? I show people, it's very, it's very, very obvious, right? And the idea is that that is a state. It is not just relaxing. It is not just 
oh, the work, work day's over. Now I'm going to relax, right? The idea is that there's a way deeper thing we can have where we can be in a state of release. Now, does that mean we want to always be 100% just doing this? All? No, it means for a long time, we want to get really good at song. We want to get really good at this, which is at a basic level, just inhaling and bringing the awareness to the body, exhaling and letting yourself relax. You will notice that this is natural. That the more you try to do it, the more it works and the easier it becomes because your body already works like this. This is not unique. This is, this is not discovery. This is there already. So the idea, you know, all the people talking about the, you know, people in the past, they had incredible memories. They could walk 12 miles a day without being injured or. or oh, you got muted there, buddy. Sorry, man. I had a call come through. You're saying about all the incredible things people in the past could supposedly do. I'd heard that even Native Americans that were first encountered in New England by the Europeans were like running around in a loincloth in the middle of winter and they didn't understand why everyone needed clothes at all. Mm -hmm. Right. There is a level. I mean, you see this like to give respect to like Wim Hof or something like him getting people to go do that kind of stuff. Now, I'd rather keep that chi personally, but if you want, if you got some chi you want to spend and that sounds fun to you, dude, go have fun because knowing that you can survive in that kind of level, like I get it. And again, not for me, I'd rather keep the chi, but it's all good. Like I understand it. And that kind of stuff is very, very uh, important to recognize that there's a much higher capacity that we can be living at. And it's really not that hard to get to. There's just certain kind of psychological blocks we got to get past where it's really hard to breathe like this, where every breath you get all the air you need. I mean, it's like giving yourself a hug just to get all the air you need. You know, it's so, so loving to yourself to just breathe in all the air you need and fill it up. And then what does that do? It brings your awareness back to your body, oh, which that makes you feel good. It brings you into the present moment, right? So when people talk about yogis, sages, Taoists, they talk about, oh, bliss, this bliss thing. This is part of the literal mechanics of it. That Every time we inhale, we actually get a little bit what's called aroused, right? So the arousal is on the inhale. So if you sniff, like you're sniffing cocaine, I never did cocaine, but I'm just, I just use this as a metaphor and I don't, you know, I don't recommend, you know, anybody do drugs or not. It's not that conversation. But if you sniff and open your eyes and kind of smile like a crazy person, you'll get like a little jacked up. Okay. So that's how your nervous system works. There's a, there's an arousal that happens on the inhale and there's a, a releasing of arousal, which happens on the exhale. Okay. And that's how we work. So that's how you know that there's a way we can breathe where all the time we're basically charging ourselves up because we get a little bit of joy. So if you breathe in and you smile like a, like a picture of the Buddha, you get a little bit of like a happy feeling, right? And that's, we're built like this, right? We're built to be able to just generate this little happiness. And then if we exhale real deep and slow, like even the expression comes out of your face. If you exhale the right way with a song breath, a nice song exhale, even the expression is going to leave your face like naturally. Like you're just going to let go of all the emotion, right? And so there's an idea that when, when we're talking about releasing and we're talking about flow, we're really talking about this. We're talking about a state of mind and body where the mind and the body are working together in this way where we inhale our joy and we exhale detachment. Right? So we're always keeping ourselves level in that way. So that's like, Again, that is like what I would consider a pretty advanced practice. But again, not that hard to get to when you know Qigong and hypnosis, to be honest. That's really great. I mean, letting go is actually a skill. It's not, we can see the evidence of that in all the people around us who can't let go of really little things. And it's really, and it is the really little things that make up the big picture. So if you have the most basic aspect of life, 
as your main focus of mastery, which is breathing, then you can do anything that you can do without focusing on your breath. I bet you can do better if you do it while focusing on your breath. And to me, that's like a, a way into this concept of the Wu way, like acting without, you know, passive action, this kind of paradoxical concept. How do you, how do you do that? But there's, you know, Qigong actually taught me this on a literal sense because at a certain point of practicing it, I realized that I could use the breath to actually move my body instead of moving it with my mind. And this was like one of those huge milestone moments for me that definitely wasn't talked about in whatever videos I learned it from. So like an example I want to give is of expanding and contracting a ball of energy that's between my palms with my hands in front of me. And so breathing in would cause everything to move in and automatically out with the breathing or I could reverse it. So all I'm doing is taking the inhale and the exhale, but the hands are moving as I do it just in perfect conjunction. And once I've even experienced this in tandem with another practitioner where he had his hands close together in front of himself, holding this energy ball. And I put mine a few inches outside of his. And as I widened the space between my hands and contracted it with the rhythm of my breath, his hands moved in tandem without him making them move by himself. And we reversed and he was able to do it back to me. And it was like really cool. <laughs> so I don't know what you might make of that, but if, or if that's a pretty common outcome, but uh, I definitely love that about Qigong that you kind of learn new tricks just by doing the same thing. What? Doesn't sound weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't sound weird to me. <laughs> Tell you what, this is when, when you want to know something that people already know that explains this partially, that's where hypnosis comes in. Because that thing you just talked about where you feel like the press is moving the body. Well, that's something to do with the subconscious mind, isn't it? Right? There's something going on there where it's not, it's you controlling it, but not directly. There's like this bigger, it feels like a higher power or something connected a little deeper. Like there's this deeper connection that we can feed into in a way. And, and yeah, I mean, it's the subconscious mind in my opinion. It's a, Big, big realization for me was when I connected the two dots there. That a lot of what we're doing with our chi is also in the same realm as our subconscious mind. Because what are these? These are the patterns that are built in, right? These are the patterns that are built in. The energetic patterns, the spiritual patterns. And when we deal in hypnosis, we deal a lot with the body. Right? The whole state of hypnosis, which is truly the same as meditation, it's just a way of going about it, is very similar. And you know the whole thing in Qigong, there's a lot of downward motion of the hands. right? And that downward motion is very relaxing. You would also use that to enter a hypnotic trance. So do not fear anybody listening to this that this means it's all hypnosis no 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 no. it's a far more complex picture than this because the energy is there and we're also human beings are also telepathic so there is a definite master major mystery here that is not a mystery like when you solve it it's more like a mystery like we should go oh <laughs> i could build a temple around it but the subconscious mind and the chi are connected. They are definitely related. There's something. Now remember that that whole concept that's coming from a Western source. The other concept is coming from an Eastern source. So that's an example of like things that could inform each other. And I find that they do. I find that they that they have something very much to do with each other. Yeah, absolutely. And really, I like that about you and it's something that i try to do as well is it's symbolic of yin and yang and balance to bridge east and west as well i mean it's just another lineman where the true source of who and what we are is found in that invisible dividing line which isn't really you know as they say often about the grand ultimate or the yin yang symbol is that that line that wavy line in the middle isn't exactly the divisor is actually the uniter 
And our, our body and astral body also have a similar dichotomy. And one last like anecdote about my own personal experiences with Qigong is that a couple of times when I was consistent with my practice a lot and I was doing some more of the more subtle and internal type of movements, I began to feel like my energy body was getting less stuck to my physical. And when I was in those states, I could practice in front of a mirror and kind of defocus my gaze a little bit and just stare at it, sort of like one of those 3D magic eye puzzles. And as I would do that, I would try to kind of push my energy body to the side a little bit, just like a little bit outside of the, the body. And I could see this faint outline of my form starting to sort of blurrily take shape in the mirror in the direction I was pushing the energy towards. So my question here is, can somebody develop their out-of-body travel abilities by practicing Qigong, or am I seeing something more like an aura? Right. So you actually are in a very interesting thing here because you've asked me, okay? So the thing is, there's like a rule, okay, that no knowledge can be denied a seeker who's ready for it. So it's because it's a podcast. That means whoever's listening to this and has the same question as you, this is also information for you. So when you ask me a question like that, you got to know that you're actually asking like four questions. And so it's then my duty to basically explain that to you and tell you what you're really asking me there. So one of the things that's going on is you're mixing things. You're mixing certain practices, which is fine because you're experimenting, right? You're doing spiritual science. So rule number one to make this like super clear is observe record, analyze, but don't yet come to conclusion, right? So the idea is that the truth is, dude, the reason people like me say don't rely on visualization is because there's a known thing and people can get, they can disagree with this if they want, but look, if you really ask around, you're not going to find people with the you know, solid bit of knowledge who would disagree with us. Clairvoyance is idiosyncratic. I'll say that again. Clairvoyance, aka spiritual vision, any kind of stuff we're seeing visually like that, any kind of that stuff is idiosyncratic. Doesn't mean what is idiosyncratic? It means unique to the individual. But it doesn't imply that the person is having a totally made up or unique experience, right? Because there will be similarities. And guess what? If people practice the same tradition and that tradition has certain teachings as far as these clairvoyant visions, then they will be similar. But even then, they'll be a little different. It's sort of like how every person is a little bit different or how every personality is a little bit different. Clairvoyance is idiosyncratic. In a way, that sensation is not. So sensation can be idiosyncratic, but it's much, 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 much less. It's like 90% less idiosyncratic. Like, for example, you might do some Qigong and you might experience, you know, something releasing some deep tension in the body. Because really, energy blockages are just tension. They're more than that. They're emotional. Struggles. But in many ways, they're tension. Okay, we always have to remember that. So that's why relaxing is so important. Okay. But say you have an experience of something moving. You might feel a tingling. You might feel it being cool. You might feel it being warm. You might feel just a sense of movement like wind or steam. But these are all recorded, right? So if you're practicing in Qigong, you might have an experience that's one of those things. There's actually different lists, like the eight sensations of Qigong. So the idea is that with sensation, it's much, much easier to know what we're getting, know what we're doing. So therefore, as a spiritual scientist, it's your job to observe your clairvoyance, not with an unhealthy skepticism, but with a healthy knowledge of idiosyncrasy, of knowing that, okay, why are there different colors for the chakras on different teachers if you go back to classical texts? Why are there different energy body systems? Why are there different things? Okay, how can you possibly have two different energy systems that were both correct? Right? How could that exist? Well, it exists because, first of all, they don't disagree. 
you just would have to go deep enough to start to see that. But it's also because that's how much the culture and the people doing this work filter the way they're seeing these things. Okay, so you as a spiritual scientist, one of the first things you have to learn how to do it, that we all have to, and this is a lifelong thing, this is an alpha and omega practice. Recognize the idiosyncrasy of your spiritual perception. Recognize that you're a weirdo. <laughs> and we all are, and are these beautiful weirdos. And you're going to be a little bit like different, right, than everyone else. But it's not as simple as you're making it up. And it's not as simple as it's not going to be somewhat the same. Near death experiences are a perfect example, right? What we know is that there is a similar thing that happens. But there is a lot of variation between there's like 22 events or something that can happen or are known to happen during a near death experience. This is an example of Western culture, but very similar to the Taoist thing. There are like 22 events that are known, but they're always different for each person. Right. So we know that these the real stuff. This is how it works. Right. And that's why we call it spiritual science, because you can then be at peace. Because then you know, okay, I had this experience, right? What did I have? Well, really, you want to interpret it like a dream in a way. You want to remember it. You want to write it down. You want to analyze it. Maybe you go all Ghostbusters and you start looking things up in the ancient texts and you start doing your research. You see what I mean? Like the question you're asking, what is actually, what actually am I doing here? Well, one thing you should know as far as your Qigong practice is you're going to want to be careful about doing anything that involves pushing energy outside of your body. Okay. That's important to know that there is a potential danger with pushing energy outside of your body, meaning because you don't have it anymore, right? So if you were to just do anything too much, you know, it wouldn't be a good thing. Energy is always leaving the body always coming into the body, right? So if you were to somehow throw off that balance, the obvious thing, right? Doesn't mean you are. I'm not saying you are. Again, not being contrary. You're doing what you just described is beautiful. It's you're doing the spiritual science. So the first thing to know is how do I look at this? Like the first question is like, I had an experience. How do I even make sense of it? Like, how do I even start making sense of it? So step one is don't make sense of it. Observe it. Write it down, analyze it, see if anything comes to you, write that down if it does. But don't go all, you know what I mean? This is the angel of the Lord come to teach me the way to lead humanity, right? Like, don't go all like that, but be like rational. Like, yo, this happened, right? That's how these ancient people that we think are so cool, like Egyptians or shamans or whatever, that's how they would do this, stuff, right? They would just go, oh, I had this dream and I'm going to let it do its thing and see if it teaches me something, right? There is a moment where you might go, Eureka, I know. Now, hopefully that's where we're going, right? So the first step is, how do I even look at this thing? Well, like that, right? Like a scientist. Isn't that fun? Isn't that like a game? It's like, you just we just made it Skyrim. Isn't that awesome, right? So, right? What do you think about that? And then I'll go on. <laughs> oh, well, it does take a lot of pressure off to just be a more neutral observer of what's going on. And it also makes sense what you said about not wanting to push energy out of the body unless you really know what you're doing and you have some reason to do it. I think in the case that I'm remembering that I would like suck back in after I, in a sense, I don't think I was really pushing it out, but you know, on, on the other hand, I wasn't like, I, I didn't feel intuitively that I should like keep doing that and try to do it on purpose. It was sort of like happened a couple of times. And I was like, Oh, this is interesting. I think I can do, I could repeat this if I, I needed to, but it didn't feel like a direction that I, I was needing to go or should go. And it was just, yeah, like you said, just a little experiment. And I had some thoughts about what it may or may not be. And I, like you said, I didn't really come to a verdict and hadn't even thought about it much until I was preparing for this conversation. I was trying to think of some of the the weirdest or most interesting Qigong related experiences I could remember. But, you know, I was wondering, or you probably want to continue, but I, I have more questions about weird Qigong powers whenever we get a moment. <laughs> there was one more thing to go along with 
your, your question you asked me, which was really three or four questions. Okay. So the first question really was like, what's a way to look at this that makes sense? And we covered that now. What were you seeing? Because I can give you a little bit of help there. You're definitely in more of the aura realm there. Okay. So auras are what I like to call spiritual VR. They're spiritual biofeedback. Everybody who sees, or like, for example, if you're an acupuncturist and you got really good and you were doing your Qigong and you're in the Chinese medicine tradition, you might start seeing the auras of patients and being able to tell which element they're weak in from their aura. But the colors you saw would correspond to the colors associated with the five elements in terms of that medicine system. So that's an example of how it works. What I'm arguing is that because human beings have this telepathic and also you know, one of the famous remote viewers, Lynn Buchanan, he said, there's not uh, six senses, there's seven. He said, six is like awareness. It's like this, this it, thing that's still physical and subconscious that people mistake for psi, but real psychic ability is actually higher than that. I believe that too. So like when I'm looking at somebody and I can tell a lot about what's going on with them emotionally by hundreds of different little body things right? That everyone has. And don't worry, I don't go around reading everyone like some pervert. But uh, I, uh, it is true, like in what I do with, you know, my arts are all about helping people relax, right? So I got to see, you know, so there's hundreds of little things I can pick up on somebody, not even know it. My subconscious mind just feeds to me, boom, this, this. And I know that feeling and I trust that instinct, right? So that's like the sixth sense. And then the seventh sense would be when something actually telepathic happens, which there's tons of evidence uh, for anyone. I'm sure you know this, but for anyone, Dean Raiden is the guy to start with, like Raiden from Mortal Kombat, right? He's like the guy who wrote a bunch of great books and he's really respected in psychic research. So Dean Raiden is the guy to take you down that journey. But what we do know is that the energy is real, the telepathy is real, right? So keep that in mind, right? If you have the ability to remote view, isn't it entirely possible that you could construct or concoct a kind of biofeedback machine that you would place over the things that you're looking at? That's really your own telepathy in a way, but you're, you're visual and you like colors. So you're perceiving it in a way that works for you. That's more functional for your personality. So that's what I think people really do. And that's, there's, that's not a hypnotic illusion. Okay. There is a thing called confabulation or complete making up things, right? But then there's something else, right? So you have telepathy on this one extreme of like totally mental, but totally accurate. And then you have the other extreme, which is imaginary, totally mental, but totally inaccurate. And then there's a spectrum, unfortunately, <laughs> between those two. And that's largely what the esotericist is more interested in, is how we get to closer to what you call the telepathy level where we're reading it directly and clairvoyance is a thing that we can use that can get us there right that's that idiosyncratic visual thing that a lot of people have right so um that's basically a way to start looking at it that like whatever you're seeing in that realm of seeing energy, whatever that means, because we don't know what that means for you yet. You got to do more research, right? More research is needed. Further research needed. Like it's a paper, right? Like it's a scientific study. Further research is needed. So that's in the realm of aura. That sounds aura-y. You can read aura stuff and find some good aura resources and compare it and draw some conclusions. But what you're really discovering is how you perceive these things. You're really discovering your apparatus. So that's the other question that you're asking. It's like, what is, what is this? Well, you're becoming aware of something and you're going to have to determine how close it is to that, from that imaginary line to that telepathic line, that completely true mental event to that completely made up mental event. And that's the, that's the delicate path that we walk <laughs> on this journey, man. That's why it's so risky. And they used to keep this stuff secret. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool, man. Well, I got to pretty much wrap this bad boy up. It's been an amazing chat. 
I wanted to ask you about the I Ching, and maybe we could talk about that more later if it's something that you're familiar with another time. I don't know a lot of I Ching, no, not really. Not. Well, it's definitely super connected into you know Taoist thought, so maybe I can come talk about I Ching on your show sometime. Yeah, that's a thing that's very important, and I know some things about it, but that's not something any that I possess the knowledge of anywhere near like Qigong or anything like that. Like, yeah. Well, I pulled a card from my uh, I Ching Oracle deck. It just puts the 64 hexagrams into a deck. And I, the card I just drew was development. And it's a, all about the air over the mountain element or the earth element. And the specific like meaning of this card is gradual, continual, steady progress. So that's like exactly one of the main topics we talked about is this slow changing movement of nature. So Anyway, I just had to let you know that I got that cool card and I'll let you take the floor, wrap up any loose threads you need to, and definitely tell people how to find you. So yeah, anybody who wants to do higher self hypnosis, which is basically a kind of guided meditation where we're using everything we know from hypnosis to enter quickly, calmly, and deeply into this wonderful trance state whenever we like, and also to exit it. I'll give you an honest thing. The way to become blocked from hypnosis, the way to stop yourself from being hypnotized is to train yourself to only be hypnotized by yourself. So if you train your body mind to only go into hypnosis when you say so, then no one can hypnotize you unless you say so. So you want to let your beloved hypnotize you, go ahead, give that person permission, right? You want to go to church and get something out of it, go ahead, give that permission. But when you learn to hypnotize yourself, that's how you know. That's you, you see, you learn about something you've been doing your whole life. The other thing is Qigong. You want to take those lessons with me. Uh, that's all available. Just find me on Instagram and contact me. Okay. Reach out to me. Send me a message. Tell me you heard me on the show and talk to me about what you're interested in doing. That's how I got a hold of you. And you answered pretty much right away. You're very accessible, my friend. I am accessible. I don't, it's clear. You know, I keep my, you know, I keep my, I'm a, you know, I'm in a wizard tower over here just so I got time for people, dude. And it's what I do all the time. So definitely hit me up if you want to do hypnosis Qigong. And look, if there are actual people out there who have like, you have issues with sleep, you've been to the doctor, you know, maybe you got a prescription you're on or something for sleeping. That's a good time to come see somebody like me for sleep. Now, I am new. I just started. haven't even graduated school yet. But just so you know, it's an unregulated profession. So it's not uh, doing anything illegal. But I can't help anybody with sleep out there. We use I use Qigong and hypnosis to help you get to sleep. So you're going to learn how sleep really works. Like I told you, I want to specialize in this. How it really works, how to really create it, and why you can't create it. Like, Things like that. So if anybody out there has that problem, also, you know, we might need to get a medical referral, which is just you going to the doctor, just getting a piece of paper signed. But anybody who has any problems like that or, you know, any any pain stuff, right? I can help with, with pain as well. But again, that's, we need to have a medical referral. But if you want to add a, like a, a nice holistic thing onto your thing that you're already doing, you can hit me up. I really can be helpful with some of that stuff. So just contact me and we'll chat. Right? It's actually not that hard to get me on the phone. I got two phone calls while we were trying to record this because my number's so out there. So it's not, <laughs> it's not hard to get me on the phone either. So even if you just want to chat. Well, thanks for giving us so much of your time today. This was really fun and I could easily do more shows with you sometime in the future if you want. And I'll be listening to your show for sure. It's, I've I've learned a lot. It's the kind of program I've actually been looking for for a while. You're the type of person I haven't quite yet found making this type of media before. I mean, I've met people with, you know, deep Qigong practices or deep esoteric knowledge. And many of them I've found as teachers online too, but I really like your style, man. And um, I'm a big fan and this was a super fun conversation. I'm really glad we had it. Thanks, dude. It was a blessing. Thank you. Thank you everybody for listening. In the immortal words of some guy from the 70s, everybody was kung fu fighting. Those kids were fast as lightning. <laughs> but seriously, there actually is a relationship between kung fu and qigong. 
And one of the cool things about actually getting into these practices or something like Tai Chi, which is also in that sphere, is that when you're doing it, you can kind of feel like a Kung Fu guy. You do these really interesting looking forms. You're moving in unusual ways. It makes you feel special. I don't know. It's one of those things where you want to be the different person (laughs) in the world today, especially. And if you're doing Qigong, you are going to be one of those kind of different people, especially if you're doing it around other people, which I actually do recommend doing because it might get them curious about what's going on and might lead to an interesting conversation about bioenergy or about chi. But seriously, there's no reason why you couldn't pick up at least a few forms or sets, if you will. The internet is full of this stuff. Seafree himself offered to teach you guys what he knows about it. I'm definitely interested in at least doing a little bit with him so I can maybe add to my repertoire. I learned from a website called longwhitecloudqigong.com. And I think the teacher on that website is a guy from New Zealand. I think, but I also got a book by him and spent a good several months trying to figure out this Qigong thing and realizing that it had a really good effect on me pretty early into it especially just the simple chi building breath work that is a major part of the practice. And you might notice if you get into Qigong that you feel like it does overlap with something maybe you've already trained in, like yogic breathing or meditation. Those things definitely do correspond to each other and have a certain shared pool of skill sets. And that's because anything that's imp- like anything that's foundational to your health, as far as physical activity goes, it probably should be modulated by the breath. I mean, that is the primary source of life and energy that we've got. So at the very least, I recommend checking out some, find some well-reviewed YouTube videos, maybe some simple Qigong sets, you know. If you want to get into more complex movements, I would recommend finding a teacher or at least a dedicated course or series that seems legit. (laughs) And you'll eventually know on your own how well it's working. I mean, this is a spiritual science, as Seafree was saying. And I forgot to mention, thank you for coming on the show, Seafree, if you're still listening at this point in the episode. I do appreciate it, my man. It was a good conversation. Want to talk to you more about all kinds of things and feel like I met a kindred spirit. I've always kind of thought that maybe I could teach some people Qigong someday. And maybe that's something I'll do. I wouldn't consider myself a master, though, and I would definitely need to probably, I don't know, get certified is the right word, but spend some time with someone who is a lot more experienced than me because my experience is highly personal and individual, which is good, but I don't have necessarily the exact training as it's passed down in any one lineage with the intention of the person learning and becoming a teacher. I'm definitely just a student of this stuff, but even as a student, I feel like I could definitely show somebody some movements that would make them feel more energized. And in my opinion, the more I do consistently do my personal sets of Qigong that I've learned, the better I feel throughout the day. But I was having trouble for a while uh, keeping up with it. I had it in my head that I didn't have time for a big 15 to 30 minute routine on a daily basis. And it is hard to fit something like that in. I mean, there's so many obligations and so many things that are necessary to do for personal daily maintenance. But after this conversation with Seafree and leading up to it, I did get into my practice more. And I was inspired by the whole notion of spiritual science and being your own spiritual scientist or esoteric investigator. In this conversation with Seafree, it really made me think, okay, if I'm not doing it regularly, then Let's figure that out. Let's experiment and see if there's a way to do it where I'll do it more regularly. And I'm happy to say that has kind of worked. I've decided to start breaking up the practice that I would typically do all at once into chunks where I do it like once an hour and maybe do it six or seven times throughout the day, smaller bite-sized chunks. And I find that I'm doing the movement. I'm spending more time on it than I was ever spending on it when I was trying to do it all at once. When I did it all at once, I'd kind of rush it or only do the movements a few times and breaking it up throughout the day as I have been has made me feel a lot more enlivened 
it actually makes the practice feel like it's more having more of an effect on me. Maybe that's just, I don't know, a subjective illusion, but it seems like to me that as an experiment, it's actually been great to do it this way, to spread it out throughout the day. It's like I'm getting a breath of fresh air <laughs> once an hour. And I'm a guy that works on a computer most of the day, in an office most of the day, so easy to get drowsy or at the very least become, you know, stuck in a bad shallow breathing pattern, not paying attention to my personal energy. So it's been, it's been cool. I again, will thank C free for being a great guest and also kind of inspiring me to pick up where I left off and start doing the Qigong thing more often because it's really worked for me. And if you are finding Innerverse right now for the first time, because you are a fan of C free and you're wondering about the second hour of the show, well, I guess I'll tell you there is a second hour of the show in case you didn't catch that in the beginning. Every episode, we do two hours with the guest and the second hour is for subscribers only. That is only a $5 a month donation on Patreon, so not a big commitment. And you do get access to a huge archive of past shows that might be in your wheelhouse if you're a fan of this esoteric life and what Seafree does. So consider checking it out. And to you guys that have been listening for a long time and still remaining on the free show, I will say... I'd love to have you hearing the type of things we talk about in the second hour once we're all warmed up and juiced up and everything's flowing and the dots are connecting. So yeah, think about supporting Interverse with a plus membership. It's the only type of financial support I actually get for the show. So it'd be pretty awesome if you did. <laughs> I do put a lot of my life force energy into this creation. A lot, a lot. Not a complaint. It's what I want to do. It's how I want to spend the chi. But I would have more to spend on the show if you would spend a little on the show. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, the second hour of the show, though, this time around was great. We talked about the reasons why teachers can be necessary for our physical and spiritual practices. Apotheosis, which is a big word that means discovering the truth by ruling out what's untrue. Solutions to a concept called imposter syndrome, which I guess is loosely defined as a feeling that you aren't worthy or able to be who you want to be. We talked about integrating the lessons of self-criticism instead of letting it destroy you or completely rejecting it. The simple solutions to physical health origins of low-grade anxiety or problematic thinking patterns. So he gave some advice about how to deal with those things. We talked about the power of hypnotherapy for just about everything, but especially for learning how to sleep better, hypnotically implanted ideas and why certain types of hypnotic regression are unethical, why self-hypnosis is much quicker and easier than psychedelics and other gateways to higher realms, and we wrapped up by talking about the reality of past life memories and opening up to your own past life memories through hypnotic regression therapy. So it was pretty cool, man. Uh, that's a good second hour for sure. <laughs> there are some gems in there, some things that made me think twice about stuff that I had thought I'd already decided on, especially when it comes to perspective and mindsets and the inner critic. I mean, I won't say that I did any big 180s on my belief systems or anything. Me and C-Free are pretty well in alignment on everything that we've explored together so far, but there was definitely food for thought in that second hour. And you might find some mind-blowing, earth-shattering revelations there for all I know. But most of all, I hope that you take away from this episode that Qigong is something that you now know about <laughs> and maybe will investigate. It's a great supplement to a yoga practice. I wouldn't say replace yoga with it necessarily. Although me, I'm more drawn to it than yoga. I feel like it actually helps me stay limber in a similar way, but maybe it's not quite got the same benefits as yoga. So I definitely wouldn't say do one or one over the other, but experiment, right? This is your spiritual science thing. And when it comes to either yoga or Qigong or any especially physical practices that we know are good for us and help us maintain healthy, vibrant life energy, we got to be aware of the feedback loops that exist, both good and bad. When it comes to this type of thing, I myself <laughs> forget and have to relearn all the time. Like I kind of talked about at the beginning of this outro, falling out of the practice and getting back into it. But these practices that build up chi 
or the lack of these practices are definitely creating feedback loops on an energetic level. You might just think that you're lazy and that's why it's hard to start a practice or restart your practice, but you might not be lazy. You might just have low chi levels. You might just need to breathe more. You might just need to do some very basic chi building exercises. And doing stuff like this is going to build up and store energy, like putting money in the bank, as I think I took this metaphor from Seafree, and it's going to make it seem much easier to do those things that you know are good for you. It's kind of like if you've not got a lot of money and you want to start eating healthier and you look at the cost of, I don't know, organic apples and you're like, I can't afford that. That's too much. It seems like it's too much because you don't have a lot in the bank in terms of money. And that might be for some reason, like you had to spend a lot on who knows a medical bill. And that's why you're thinking that you want to start eating healthier and see if you were already in the process of eating healthier, then you might've had more energy with which you might've generated more currency because you were more able to do whatever it is that you do to generate currency. And then you'd have more in the bank. And then that apple wouldn't seem very expensive. It's kind of the same deal when it comes to these type of physical practices, Qigong, yoga, etc. If you've already got energy in the bank and you know how you got it, which is from something like Qigong, then it's going to be that much easier to make the choice to spend your energy doing that thing, especially because you know there's a return on the investment and you actually will feel energized and more like you got more in the tank than you did before you started it. Unlike other types of workout where you might feel pretty thrashed and pretty tired afterwards, really sore. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't do other types of exercise. I'm experimenting myself, (laughs) been hitting the gym more often lately, doing more weightlifting, a little more cardio and seems to be good for me. I see. I like how it makes me feel when I even, even the feeling of soreness, but definitely shouldn't let that be a substitute for the chi building practices. In fact, then you're just spending a lot of energy without building it back up, without putting more in. And I'm starting to really see that now, why it's so important to actually follow through on the stuff I know that's good for me, especially Qigong, because I do know that that's good for me. I've had countless experiences of feeling kind of low, feeling kind of drained, doing some basic Qigong, not even necessarily a full form or full set, whatever you want to call it, and being right back in the game after that, feeling a lot better even with simple stuff, even without doing it to completion. So anyway, don't get stuck in a negative feedback loop. Put yourself in a positive feedback loop. Maybe the hardest part of it is making the choice to do it, especially because if you're low energy, it just seems hard to make choices that are good for you for some reason. At least I I feel that way. (laughs) Like the more tired I am, the later I stay up past my, you know, healthy circadian rhythm, bedtime, the more likely I am to do something silly, like eat, go to the store at midnight and buy ice cream or who knows. It's like my willpower gets lower, the less energy I have. So to me, it just seems like it makes sense to follow through and keep doing the stuff that builds up the chi. I may have rambled on enough about this at this point, but I'm really into this topic. And there's a lot more stuff that I'd like to talk to Seafree about that he gets into in his show, especially like Western esotericism where the convergence between those two for him was what forms of Western occultism he studied. Like, you know, I want to pry the deep secrets from the darkest reaches of his mind. (laughs) But yeah, I got one more thing before I play you guys out, which is to tell you about the music I'm going to play you out with. It's actually a track called The Immortal, and it's actually by Seafree. I found it on his Patreon. He told me I could use it. So here we got a guy living the dream big time. He's actually getting into creating conscious music. Pretty awesome hip hop. And in the lyrics, it's got a lot to say about, in a more poetic way, about the things we've been talking about in this episode. And that's how you know somebody is really passionate about what they do when they start rapping about it. And this guy's great. I love C Free. And I love this track. I'm excited to play it for you. You can find stuff he's doing on Patreon if you go look up This Esoteric Life on there. And, of course, patreon.com forward slash interverse for the plus extension. And if you are new to the show, remember you can subscribe to the free version of it all over the place. 
iTunes, Spotify, Google Play app, YouTube. Hell, I even put the video versions on Facebook. Pretty much if there's anywhere you can imagine you might be able to find the show, you can find it there. So subscribe there if you like that place better than wherever you found it to begin with. And thanks for being here. Oh, yeah. And you could also drop a review on like the iTunes podcast app if you use that, because those are great. Those help out a bunch and they're free for you to do. So I implore you, share the podcast with your friends, tell people about it that you think could benefit from hearing this type of information. I think most everyone can benefit from this information about our life force energy and chi. That's why I like this episode so much. It felt pretty universally applicable to everybody. So I love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Very much appreciate you checking out this show. Remember, you can also subscribe to Sea Freeze This Esoteric Life all over the place. And I guess that's it. I'll talk to you guys in about a week. Got more good stuff to come. Bye bye. Zero flex with steps like an immortal, so it rests. The scent of his flesh is floral, he's never stressed. But stress is your chi is a portal, and the flow of it is pure unless you're being immoral. And he can see in tomorrow, infinite discipline, although it seems informal. He knows the alchemy for getting free from sorrow, and he can teach it, although his mystique is borrowed from the aura of the earth. Yin Chi in his abdomen, from horror to mirth, live free and masculine, plethora of rebirths. What on earth is happening? Humans reverse, caught in Lucifer's trap again. Give him hell in each verse, he don't need to eat first. Breathe chi into the LDT until you see a deep worth. <laughs> Do that which we agree works. The aura that frightens wickedness. The self mastery that heightens innocence. The qigong that brightens imminence. And a song to cause righteous incidents. Full humans who use light like instruments. Rulers, druids doing divine impetus. He worships God, but don't mind dissonance. Proto physicists seeing signs of omnipotence. Vibes of tribes, so choose wise. See things with new eyes, ears etherically alert to that which few surmise. Making miracles from dirt, cause we really do try. Remember Tony Montana hated his life, so wait till it's right. See peace and never be baited by spite. Keep secrets and never leak. Hated the mic. Work hard just to chill and have a stableist life. Listen, homie, you'll be God if you're just patient and right. And build a body and a psyche that can take in the light. Don't worry if they think the Matrix is right Your blazing Dantians will be their savior in the night Heal you and find some gods to appeal to And bring back some knowledge for the people that's real true Heal you and find some gods to appeal to And bring back some knowledge for the people that's real true